When I told my Jewish mother I was going to become a minister, her response was, why Jesus? My dad's response was, I want you to go talk to the rabbi. And if you'll go to law school, I'll pay for it. <laughs> well, they weren't the only ones uncomfortable with me becoming a minister and it having to do with Jesus. After 28 years of being a unity minister, I have come in contact with a number of people who are uncomfortable hearing Jesus quoted, hearing stories about Jesus, and I've been surprised by that because they come to unity, they like metaphysics and new thought principles, but they haven't quite understood what Jesus is all about from a unity perspective. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Who was Jesus and what was he all about? Because I believe when we understand what he is really about, we don't feel uncomfortable with hearing Jesus quoted or learning about what he had to teach. Because what he had to teach was universal. His message was very non-threatening and very loving and supportive. So today, I want to talk to you about what Jesus is not. To dispel some of those ideas that you might have grown up with or heard that made you feel uncomfortable. I once dated a lady who had been married to a minister for many years, and she told me that she always kind of felt uncomfortable with the idea that Jesus is the only way to God. And if you don't believe in Jesus, you're going to go to the hot place. Well, my first point today is Jesus is not a payment for the sins of humanity. What? That's a big one. That is a core idea in traditional Christianity. That because of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, they sinned, they got thrown out of the garden, and because of that, human beings were born into sin and were sinners. And because God is a just God, he needed to somehow make up for that sin, so he sent Jesus, his son, as a payment for the sins of humanity. And if you accept that payment, you're forgiven. If you don't, well, you're off to the hot place, okay? That is the basic idea. And if somebody wants to believe that, that's fine. I mean, whatever makes them happy. But I don't believe that's what his message and his teaching was all about. In fact, this idea of him being a sacrifice is a carryover from primitive religions. If, a, the, if lightning struck and burned down a hut or somebody got hurt, what would people do? They'd make sacrifices and offerings to the gods in order to appease them. This whole idea of sacrifice carried over into the ancient Hebrews where they would make sacrifices of their, the best in their flock as a sign of their relationship and covenant with God. You might remember the Old Testament story where Abraham took his son Isaac onto a mountain and was going to sacrifice Isaac for God. And then at the last minute, God changed his mind. Good for Abraham and even better for Isaac. See, that carried over into this idea of Jesus being a sacrifice. Remember, the early Christians were Jewish. And so it, it, it's pretty natural that this idea could carry over. I was reading an article about a lady who went to uh, a church 20 miles from Jerusalem. This was a number of years ago. And they were, still, they were doing actual still live sacrifices of animals in church. Actually, the, the altar in a church is a carryover of the chopping block of sacrifices. So it, it, it's natural to think, well, Jesus was the sac perfect sacrifice who shed his blood for the many, right? You've heard that terminology. He was a lamb of God, a sacrifice, his blood shed for everyone. 
Well, some, of, some have referred to this whole idea as a really hideous dogma of the vicarious atonement. Hideous dogma. <laughs> there was an a English couple living in China with a family, and they had a Chinese nurse living in their home. And when she entered the home, something bothered her. And as time went over, she got even more upset about something. And they, they were like, what's the matter? What, what's, what's wrong? She said, well, you, you're obviously good people and you're good parents. What I don't understand is how come in every room and even on the stairwell, there is a picture of a criminal being killed in this horrible punishment that we don't even know about in China. She was referring to the crucifixion, pictures of Jesus' crucifixion throughout the house. Why has that been held up so much in Christianity? Because, supposedly, he was a sacrifice for the sins of, of all. But here's the thing. Focusing on his death and forgetting about what his life was all about, what his teachings were about and all that, that's similar to taking the life of John F. Kennedy and just focusing on his death and forgetting the other stuff that he did. Or Abraham Lincoln, focusing on his assassination and forgetting everything else that Abraham Lincoln did. See, it's a story half told. Instead of what was Jesus all about? It wasn't about his death. It was about his life. It was about how do you have a connection with God the way he did. So Jesus was, was not crucified in payment for original sin. Jesus, by the way, I'm saying what I believe. If other people want to believe differently, that's fine. But this is how unity teaches. This is what I believe about Jesus. And I believe it's a more inclusive, universal understanding of what he was all about. Jesus didn't ask to be worshipped. Some people see Jesus as their Lord and their Savior. Because he came to save people. Somebody sent me an email about the argument between Jesus and Satan. You know that one? They were, ha they were arguing about who was better on his computer, and God was, got frustrated and said, okay, look, we're going to have a contest, and I'm going to test you for two hours, and you're going to do all that you can on the computer, and we'll see who does a better job. So they sat down at their keyboards, Satan and Jesus, and started doing spreadsheets, reports, faxes, emails, all kinds of stuff. They downloaded, they did genealogy reports, they made cards, they did every known job to man. And about 10 minutes before their time was up, lightning flashed across the sky, thunder, and guess what? The power went out. Satan stared at the blank screen and screamed every curse word known in the underworld, and Jesus just sighed. The electricity finally flickered back on and each of them rebooted their computers. Satan stared, searching frantically, screaming, It's gone! It's gone! I lost everything when the power went out. Meanwhile, Jesus quietly started printing out all of his files from the past two hours. Satan observed this and became irate. Wait! He must have cheated. How did he do that? God shrugged and said, Jesus saved. Jesus, uh, some people look at Jesus as the Savior. Now, I can understand if a person discovers Jesus and they've been living caught up in the world and, and just the world of the senses and they, are, they were having a difficult time and then they turned to God and they started living a spiritual life and their life changed. That's happened for me. That's happened for a lot of people. So for them, Jesus becomes their savior. Well, I believe the message of Jesus was not about him, but about the presence and power of God that worked through him 
and that is also inside of you and inside of me. St. Paul said, Christ in you, your hope of glory. See, it's not Jesus that is saving us. It's the power of God that Jesus was pointing us to. There's an ancient Chinese saying, the teacher points to the truth and the student worships the pointer. Jesus was pointing to the truth. He was saying the kingdom of God is within you. He was saying God is within you. You can have the same relationship with God that I have with God. Follow me. The works that I do, you can do in greater works. He wasn't pointing to himself. In fact, someone came to Jesus and said, called him good master. And Jesus said, why are you calling me good? There's only one good, and that is God. See, he deflected it away from him, from himself, and he pointed it, there's one presence and power, God. Jesus didn't ask to be worshipped, and he was not the only incarnation of God on earth. See, that's another belief, that God took human form as Jesus and walked upon the earth. Well, God is walking upon the earth as all of us. He didn't just incarnate as Jesus. He's incarnating as every human being on the planet. Jesus, uh, God is manifesting as flowers, plants, the earth, and human beings. So... Jesus isn't the only incarnation of God on the planet. The only real difference between you and me and Jesus is that Jesus knew that he was an expression of God. He knew it, but the potentiality was the same. He wasn't God walking the earth as Jesus. He was, but he wasn't the only one. You and I are God walking the earth as us. The difference is he knew it and expressed it. And we're learning and we're growing. Christ is not Jesus' last name. Jesus was not born to Mr. and Mrs. Christ. Christ refers to God within. Christ refers to the divinity that expressed through Jesus. Christ refers to that divinity that expresses through you and through me. It's that all that, that wholeness, that life, that love, that wisdom, that power, that all good that's inside of us, that is the Christ. And Jesus so fully expressed it that he became known as Jesus the Christ. Jesus the Christ, because, as he said, he who sees me has seen the Father. What does that mean? It means that he so fully expressed the Christ, the divinity, the God within, that to see him was to see God. Hey, look, we all have our moments, probably every day, where at some point we're expressing love, we're expressing joy, we're expressing peace, and that's expressing God. He who sees you in those moments of love and happiness and joy are seeing the Father, the Mother, the presence of God flowing through you. That's the Christ coming forth. When you and I are fully aware of the presence of God like Jesus was, a completely self-realized, God-realized person, then we become Justin the Christ, Kathy the Christ, Charles the Christ, because you're expressing your divinity. You're expressing complete, full awareness of what it means to be a child of God, what it means to have that power of God flowing and expressing as you. By the way, the Christ principle, the, the presence and activity of God, 
is independent of Jesus, whether Jesus lived or didn't live. I mean, of course, I believe he lived and he, he did what we understand him to do. But if he hadn't lived, that doesn't change the Christ principle. Christ is still within every person, whether Jesus walked the planet or not. You see, it's just that Jesus discovered it and expressed it fully and completely. It's because of the Christ within him that he was able to love in the face of hatred. It was because of the Christ within him that he was able to demonstrate the abundance of God. It was because of the Christ within him that he was able to demonstrate healing and all that we see that he did. So Christ is the divinity within, not Jesus' last name. The only begotten Son of God was not the man Jesus, but again, the Christ within him. You might remember, and maybe this still happens, I don't watch sports as much as I used to, and, but I remember years ago as a kid or a teenager, you could be watching a basketball game or a football game or a boxing match or a golf match, whatever, and all of a sudden, this man with multicolored hair would show up with a sign on television, and it said John 3.16. Well, I don't know if I ever did look up John 3.16, but I knew it had something to do with the Bible. You might know John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe upon him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. Whoa, that's a loaded verse, isn't it? that whoever believed upon him. So it's been taught that Jesus is the only begotten son. That God took his one son, sent him to the earth, and if you don't believe in that son, then you're going to perish, right? Yikes. Let me ask you a question. How, does, how is it that God has only one son? Didn't God create all of us? Are we all sons and daughters of God? Or is there just some special holy family up there that we're not really a part of? And God has his one son that he sent down. I thought I was a son of God. I thought you were a son and a daughter of God too. So what's this thing about I feel like a stepchild right now. You know, why is it that this guy is the only son? Because he's not. It doesn't make sense. And theologians have tried to explain how is it that God came to earth as Jesus and he's also the son at the same time? Good question. How are you 100% God and the son at the same time? Good question. Well, because the Son of God is that which is only begotten of God. Again, it's the Christ. It's the divinity. It's the spiritual essence of who you are. That's the only thing begotten of God. Now, you might have had an al people might have had an alcoholic parent, and they were begotten of that alcoholic parent, and it affected them. Or they were begotten of their environment. You might say, well, yeah, it's understandable why he is the way he is. He grew up in such a rough environment. You know, okay, so it impacted his behavior, impacted his attitudes. All right, we get that. We understand that. You can be begotten of your genes. You're like, well, my family all has a bad temper, and it's kind of in my genes. I'm artistic. It's in my genes, whatever it is. That's understandable, but there's something about you that is only begotten of God. That's like Myrtle Fillmore. Her family had been sickly, and she realized, as a child of God, I do not inherit sickness. In other words, there is something in me that is only begotten of God, and God don't make sickness. God makes wholeness. God makes love. God makes joy. God makes peace. God makes calmness. God makes all kinds of good. That is what's only begotten of God. 
God can only beget him or herself in and as you and in and as me. There's that in you that's whole and complete and perfect. The perfect child of God. Now, we may not be expressing it all the time. I know I'm not. But we have it. It's, the only, it's that which is only begotten of God. Jesus did not teach that you must believe in him or you will be punished. Jesus didn't teach that. For example, John 8, verse 24, except you believe that I am he, he is italicized, you will die in your sin. Except you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. Well, guess what? The word he is italicized. Why? Because the translator decided that they wanted to put the word he in there. That's why it's italicized. You go, Reverend, is that really true? I mean, is that true that people actually put words in the Bible that really weren't meant to be there? Yes. You know, the Bible was written by scribes. They didn't have computers or typewriters. They wrote by hand. And if you wanted a Bible, they had to write it by hand until the printing press, many, 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 many years later, it was written by hand, and guess what? Some of the, the scribes would misspell words. The scribes would decide to add a word. I mean, there's numerous times where the scribes added words. They even added stories. There are stories in the Bible that are famous, that we all know, that were added. Why? Because it fit the scribes or the translator's belief. They're like, well, it can't certainly end like this. Let's put that story, let's put the story in there so it ends the way it should end. That's the way to, you don't believe me, go read a book about Bible history and you will see that. The translator did not understand, except you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. So he decided to put the word he in there. And people interpret it as Jesus. Except you believe that Jesus is who he says he is, you're going to die in your sins. It totally changes the whole meaning of the sentence. It's I am. Except you get in tune with the I am, the God presence within you, you're going to have some problems. Right? Sin is simply a word that means, it comes from an ancient archery term, means missing the mark. If you shoot an arrow and you miss the bullseye, you miss the mark, baby. If we're not in tune with our divinity, we're going to miss the mark at times. We're going to get involved, caught up in the world, and we're going to, you know, become very discouraged, upset, like myself when I was younger, lost sense of meaning and purpose, and all kinds of things. But when you're connected and rooted in the I am, the God presence. Remember when Moses was in the wilderness? He came upon the burning bush and he got the inner experience. He asked God, who should I say sent me to the Egyptians? And he heard, I am that I am. I am is God in you, God's name in you, God's nature in you. Except you be in tune with that I am then you're going to have problems and challenges and difficulties and lack the resource that you could have if you knew that I am. When I was, uh, a f not that long ago actually, while being a minister and living in New York, I oversaw the care of my mother who was in a nursing home. She was in there for bone cancer. And my stepfather who was in another nursing home because he could no longer walk and I oversaw their care from New York. Managed their care, frequently called them, talked to doctors, talked to all kinds of people for, I don't know how many years, three, four years. Anyway, and then eventually they passed away, as well as my, my biological dad. And the amazing thing to me was the poise that I had through that whole experience. These were people I deeply loved. 
And yet, because of the I am presence, the God presence, my connection with it, I didn't suffer the way a lot of people suffer through these kinds of things. And I really feel it was from that connection with spirit. And this last year of the pandemic, you know, there's a lot of people. It must have been a hell on earth for a lot of people this past year. But I'm going to say, and it's been tough for all of us. But let me say, the people who were connected with that I am presence, that God presence, they had a source of strength and a source of peace and a source of comfort that the world couldn't give them. I know that. So this is what this is about. Except you believe in the I am, connect with the source of God within you, you're going to have troubles. You're going to have difficulties. That's the way it is. Jesus did not give us a creed to parrot. A lot of people, Christianity has been a religion about Jesus. What we're interested in is the religion of Jesus. What was he teaching? What was his consciousness that he attained? What was his realization that he attained? And how can we do the same? That's what he was about. It wasn't about him. It was about us. It was about how do we get connected with spirit? How do we know that? How do we live according to it? So I hope some of these ideas help you to realize, oh, wow, wow. I can relate to Jesus more now. It's not such a threat. He didn't hold up a bunch of threats about believe this or else and I, you got to accept this or else. No, that's, that's people stuff. That's dogmas. That's things that people created and projected onto. I'm not saying they tried to disillusion anybody. I'm not saying they were trying to... Uh, deceive people. No, I believe they believe that. But look, we're in a new time. You know, we've grown, we've learned. And I think that uh, it's okay to expand our understanding of what Jesus was all about. He didn't say, you know, he was not crucified in payment for original sin. He was not asking us to worship him as a person. He was not the only incarnation of God on the planet. Christ is not Jesus' last name. And he was not the only begotten son of God. And he didn't teach that you believe in him or be punished. And he didn't give us a creed to parrot. So we've been talking about what Jesus was not. But what was Jesus? Jesus was a person like you and me who was born in Bethlehem from Joseph and Mary. He grew up in Nazareth. He took on his profession of his dad, became a carpenter. And he realized and discovered and knew something very powerful within himself. He knew and experienced the presence and activity of God. He knew and experienced it to such a degree that he knew that he was a living expression of that presence of God. He knew and discovered that the kingdom of God was within him. And he said that, is it not written that ye are gods with a little g? He said, people look here and there for signs of the kingdom, but I say the kingdom of God is within you. If you have a need, then pray. It, that he told us that we can experience God the same way that he could. Follow me. The works that I do, you can do, and greater works than these. Jesus was about teaching and inspiring and encouraging and being a role model and demonstrating for us and the world what it means to be a child of God. What, by whatever name you call that, whether you call it Allah, the Great Spirit, Brahman, doesn't matter. It's this presence and intelligence and activity that's everywhere present. And Jesus knew that he was one with it. He said, I and the Father are one. What does that mean? It means that you are an expression of God the way a wave is an expression of the ocean. 
Jesus didn't come here to talk about how wonderful he was and what he was. He came to show you and to show me what we are. And we're still learning to embrace that. We still have low self-images of ourselves. We still have not grasped the level and understanding of what he was all about. Oh, but it will make me arrogant, Justin, if I walk around going, I am God, I am the Father. He wasn't saying that. The more we realize what we really are, the more humble we become about it. Because we realize, of myself, I can do nothing. It is the Father within me that does the work. I'm simply a vehicle. I'm simply a channel. That's what Jesus said. That's what Jesus was all about. And, you know, because he was an enlightened being, I believe he's still in the dim other dimension. People like to talk to Jesus. They like to pray to Jesus. That's fine. The Fillmores were very much into talking to Jesus. They, they saw Jesus as a way shower, an elder brother. We might use contemporary languages and say he was a mentor. He was a coach. He went before us. He discovered what it means to be a child of God. He lived it. He did it. And now he can help us do the same. It's, it's like anyone who might pray to angels or, or pray to their guides or pray to Buddha or pray to Muhammad or pray to Moses. People pray to Jesus. That's fine, too. He's an enlightened being, and it might be very difficult to relate to this infinite totality that God is, the allness of God. That might be difficult for people to relate to. They can relate better to a physical being that they, ha they have an idea of what he looks like. They can relate to him, and so they relate to the man Jesus. That's fine, but I just think it's important to realize that it's not the man Jesus, it's the God presence expressing through him. And I believe that, yeah, it's fine. Talk to Jesus, relate to Jesus, ask Jesus for his help. He is the elder brother, coach, mentor, however you want to look at it, who is here to support you and to so support me. And if you don't want to talk to Jesus, fine, don't. You are an expression of God. Connect with the Christ within you. That's what Jesus was all about. And as Thomas Truard once said in his book, Bible Mystery and Bible Meaning, he said, Jesus came not to proclaim himself, but man will add woman as well. Not to tell us of his own divinity, separating him from the race and making him the great exception, but to tell us of our divinity and to show in himself the great example of the I am reaching its full personal expression you too can reach your full personal expression of the divinity within by following him, following the Christ within you, seeking to embody this presence that we're all called here to do. Thank you, Father, Mother, God, for your wonderful example in Jesus. Thank you for the life that he lived and for the truth that he demonstrated and thank you for helping us to evolve in our understanding of what he was all about and for helping us to know the truth within ourselves, to stop looking outside so much, to learn to look more within and to trust your activity in our lives, to look to you for fulfillment and joy and strength and power and happiness. Thank you for guiding us and healing us of our limiting beliefs, healing us of the stuff that we've carried on in religion and believed that have held us back. Thank you for freeing us to expand our consciousness, to embrace this incredible person named Jesus, who was a light in the world, who has a teaching that's very powerful. And thank you for helping us to know it within our own being. We are truly grateful. And let us know together that the light of God surrounds us the love of God enfolds us. The power of God protects us. The presence of God watches over us. Wherever we are, God is and all is well. And so it is. Thank you, God. Amen. And thank you for joining us today for 
our live stream service with the Unity Center of New York City. I'm Justin Epstein, and I will see you again next time.